I'm Brandon Gingelbach with the Fort Worth Chamber of Commerce. Hello, welcome, happy Thursday. Um, we have uh, our virtual learning series, Leaders Online, again um, here today. Um, yesterday, uh, you missed out if you didn't get to see and hear about uh, password sanitization. We talked about security and data as it relates to um, all the issues that we're facing working from home. Um, you can find our webinars on our COVID-19 webpage for past webinars. Um, today, uh, we're going to be talking about the tax impacts with regards to federal funding. Um, so really pleased today to be able to talk to John Karp and Kristen Sayeg. And um, John, I'll introduce uh, briefly, he's got uh, 25 years of tax advisory and financial services and public accounting experience focused on C corporations, S corporations, partnerships, and high net worth individuals. Um, and then Kristen Sayeg is a pu certified public accountant and has been with Whitley Penn since 2011. Uh, most of her practice has been centered on working with entrepreneurs, closely held businesses, and high net worth individuals focused on estate planning, financial planning, income tax planning, and professional account services. So we're pumped to have John and Kristen for you all to talk to us and talk to our membership and the business community um, about what are the tax implications of the federal funding that uh, uh, has been released so far and we'll have more federal funding um, it sounds like over the next few days, they'll have some new programs that are that are probably launched. So um, I'm going to hand it over to you all. Um, for those that are on, you know how it works. We've got a Q&A function on, on Zoom. So type in your questions and uh, I'll be sure to make sure those questions are asked. Um, we look forward to hearing it. And, um, and John, I know you specifically have some COVID experience with your family um, that uh, hit, hits close to home. Um, so I look forward to hearing about that and, and, and about uh, the work you all are doing to help businesses on the, the financial um, stimulus side of things. So Kristen, John, take it away. Thank you so much. Kristen, you can pop up that first yeah. slide there. So or the, you can share your screen. Um, so my name is John Carp. I'm a tax partner really Penn. I'm not going to go back into my introduction again. But so my personal experience, just so everybody knows, because I do think that if you haven't had a personal experience yet, you will. Um, it's just a matter of when. That my daughter spent 40 days in isolation and seven days of that was in the ICU in Fort Lauderdale as she came back from studying in a, from a trip that her school, it was a school function trip studying the educa educational systems of Ireland. Um, so we just got her home on Tuesday of this week, finally. But, and that was after six weeks of took for any 20 year old, you can imagine she spent all that time in isolation. So we're really glad to have her home, but it, um, you know, she had a really great outcome. She at first didn't speak out about this and she actually turned around and started talking to folks about it, staying home and just being careful because 20 year olds were not supposed to get this. And she saw a news story about someone whose lungs looked exactly like hers. And she said the difference between her and him was he died and she lived. So she understands the gravity of the situation, which is it could be very dire for people and you just never know how it's going to hit anybody. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and it's going to be interesting to see how, I mean, there's even things in here that we don't even know yet. Um, but depending on what the costs are for folks, but for instance, I can personally tell you that the medical costs, right. Or while I don't think it would qualify, the way they've got it, the questions have become, what about people who don't have insurance and how are they really going to do this and, and those things? Because for insurance companies, they're trying to pay these, but I can also tell you that my insurance company is not paying my co-pays and deductibles, um, just as an aside. So it's very tricky how it's all done. Um, if you go to the second slide real quick, this is just a quick disclaimer that as we go through, we just want to make sure that you're consulting your tax advisors because everybody's situations can be a little different and we certainly don't want this to come across in a certain way. Then you go make, do something and it turns out it did not fit your situation because that could be, we want to make sure everybody takes away from this. The agenda, we're going to look at, we're just going to give you a few updates. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the paycheck protection loan, the program loan in terms of updates, you know what, and it's really what we know and then what we don't know. And then we're going to go right into the tax law updates. So just go ahead to the next slide. You know, so no, what we really want everybody to know is 
$310 billion, more dollars is coming on these loans. If you're not in line yet, make sure you get in line. Depending on what you're reading, if you go down all the way down to the bullet point where it says two-year loan with 1% interest, people are still a little over the, all over the roadmap because the legislation said four years. So make sure you're on board with your banker. If you haven't consulted your banker, your tax folks can't really help you with this certain part. The bankers are really the gatekeepers and we can help you with the tax side. And even if you go up who gets it, the businesses with fewer than 500 employees, the sole proprietors, nonprofits. One of the interesting parts of the law that there's not really guidance, and I've been having this with several banks, how you pay tax becomes really important. Because if you're a partnership and it's just you and one other person, a lot of the banks haven't figured out how to do that yet. We can go to the next one. Yeah, and I just wanted to chime in. We didn't give you our edited slides here. We're, we're showing you how these slides were when we started this presentation um, a couple weeks ago, and now the changes that have occurred just to illustrate how much is rapidly changing. So like this slide in particular, we, those aren't our edits. It's when to apply previously, and now in the, in the orange or red, what, what's the case now? <laughs> right, and so realize the law hasn't been signed yet. The expectation is that the law is gonna be signed but if you haven't, if you've said, oh, I want to get in on this round, you need to be going to your bank before we even hang up this phone. I mean, I'm being sarcastic, but you need to really make sure you go do that immediately. Um, and so make sure you're working with your, your tax practitioners, your professionals, and getting everything you need for those loans. Yeah, and we also wanted to provide more information in the slide since, um, you know, there's a lot of detail that goes into this. So we are not touching on everything, but y'all will have access to the slides afterwards. The short and sweet of the loan size for the PPP is it's basically two and a half times your average monthly payroll costs, but there's many caveats and many definitions that go into that. We've listed out on this slide what payroll costs include and what they do not include. Again, many caveats and clarifications that are coming out trying to answer questions for that. How can you use the loan? Um, the PPP can be used for payroll costs, salaries, commissions, health care. Um, any interest on mortgage obligations, rent, or utilities. So kind of the four areas to think about are payroll, mortgage, rent, and utilities. Now there's rules that we're not going to really go into as to what portion can be used in each of these categories, um, but if, if you've got expenses in those areas, you may consider the PPP loan as an option for you. Right, and so just remember free money. So here's the whole tax side, right? If it's free, that means you don't pay tax on it but make sure you're looking at this forgiveness amount and to seek forgiveness, right? You've got to make sure you submit to your lender and where are you going to get most of those payroll costs, either from your tax practitioner, a payroll company. So make sure, and then again, the banks are the gatekeepers. What I can say is that as people were going into this loan provision, they were looking at the CPAs and their accountants to provide the information, but every bank I dealt with asked for different information. So I would suggest making sure you go to your banks to make sure that you understand exactly what they're going to need from you. So you can go to your tax practitioner and ask. Mm -hmm. Okay. Lo loan forgiveness. I really want to just call your attention to the last thing, you know, keep tracking this. Um, there's a governor, there's not a governor, sorry, a Senator out of Wisconsin who's trying to change the provisions of the forgiveness and saying, well, look, maybe it'll be taxable income. If your income fell, maybe it won't. I don't think he's going to get any traction but they're really trying to figure out, okay, what if you're a big company, you were cash flush, you really didn't need the loan, but you got it. Should you really get it tax-free? I, I don't think it's going anywhere, but I would make sure to keep tracking this because this is changing and things are coming up every day. And it's really like almost an hour by hour deal. And I think what's most telling for where this sits right now is this slide on what we do not know. These are a lot of questions we're getting from our clients and we just still don't have the guidance or the clarification on it. Um, the, the PPP um, instructions talk about forgiveness of costs incurred and payments made. So does that mean both the cost has to be incurred and the payment has to be made during the eight week period of forgiveness? Or should that be an or instead of an and? What, what does that actually mean? We don't know yet. Can we deduct on the tax return payments made with forgivable funds? So if you use $100,000 of the PPP that ultimately is forgiven to pay for salary expense, has your taxable income actually gone up now by $100,000 because you're not going to be able to deduct the salary expense that was 
paid for with forgivable funds. We don't have clarification on that yet. Can a self-employed person use forgivable funds for interest rent and utilities? The way the SBA just issued guidance uh, last week or so specifically for Schedule C sole proprietors, and in there, they talk about the forgivable funds being used for 850 seconds of line 31 Schedule C income. So that's the net income on Schedule C. That's what they said is supposed to be forgiven for a sole proprietor. That does not include interest, rent, and utilities. We kind of think that was uh, oversight and clarification when they were trying to clarify what could be forgiven. But if you take it for what it actually says right now, it doesn't include interest, rent, and utilities. Um, federal income tax and withholding and payroll taxes, there's been a lot of discussion on if those items should be included in the loan amount or in the forgivable portion. The CARES Act says to exclude them, that the act passed by Congress says to exclude them. SBA has hinted at including them in the calculation. So here we're getting two different sets of sets of rules. And this is where really the relationship with the banker comes into to play because the, you're going to follow what your bank tells you. The bank is going to be the relationship and the one and how they're interpreting this non-guidance and where it is right now is, is going to be key. We have not received clarification on if self-rental payments are forgivable. Could you pay a building that you're renting from yourself and that be part of the rental payment that's forgiven? Um, we really need clear guidance on the calculation for reduction of forgiveness based on um, if a business cuts employees. They've got all kinds of dates and periods and look backs to, to be involved in the calculation. And you can come up with multiple examples of why they wouldn't make sense. And we don't really think that that's what they intended the law to say, but that's the way it's written right now. So we need some clear guidance on that. Um, we don't have guidance on if you were a sole proprietorship last year and in 2020 have changed to an S corporation and now can issue yourself a wage. What happens if you changed your business structure or what if you didn't exist in 2019 and you started a business in 2020? Can you apply for this? We still don't have that guidance there. We also don't know now that we have received some clients who have gotten their PPP funds, what's the proper accounting for it? Best advice we can give there is just be extremely detailed in how you're using the funds. Use them how they're supposed to be used. Don't borrow from the PPP lot, knowing that in eight weeks you're going to give the money back there. Try to be as clean as you can about it, but there's nothing out there yet that says this is how we expect to see the items booked on your P&L or booked on your balance sheet. Also, um, the Health and Human Services funding, if you, if you receive funds from that and are now needing to give it back, there's no guidance on on how those right. fundings are gonna work. Right, so what it said, so that's if you're a Medicare provider, so if you're a healthcare agency and you received some of the money that came out for healthcare, which was just basically, if you received government funds, they gave you a percentage. And so what happens now is you have 30 days to, to then start to give it back, but they really haven't talked about, well, what if you only needed 70% of those funds? So there's a lot of information in here that they're gonna have to come out with guidance um, on how this works. The other one is, what if you're a sole, you just started your business, which I know we talked about, but you're a sole proprietor, you started in 2020. So you weren't around, they, and they keep saying they're gonna give guidance, but they haven't yet. And now I want you to think about how fast the first tranche of money ran out. The second tranche is probably gonna run out just as fast. Yeah. So. Okay, so now jumping gears away uh, from the PP. John, Go ahead. if I could interrupt with a question. So sure. a lot of unknowns, the, the question I have, do you think some of those will be answered in this next round of federal stimulus, or do you think th this will be something that is um, sort of wrapped up on the back end? You know, it's a so actually, Chris and I were talking right before we came on, and um, wh one of the interesting sides is so what if you couldn't get any part of this money because the guidance wasn't there? So, I mean, we were getting guidance on April sixteenth, which was you know thirteen days after the people started filing. And if you weren't in line and you didn't have a good relationship with your bank, or your bank dragged their feet, hmm. um, then you didn't get any money. So the real question is going to become, I don't know if we're going to get any more guidance. We may get some more FAQs. Like the way, like if you go, and we're going to put this up at the end, but if you go to our website, we have a COVID sheet and we are, we're constantly updating FAQs, frequently asked questions. Hmm. And I think what's going to happen is maybe the tax legislature, I mean, listen, if this is if I could close my eyes and be a fortune teller, so there's no fact data on this, 
But so w- will there be in 2020, hey, I didn't get any funding. I don't have payroll, so I couldn't use any of the credits that you offer for some of the payroll tax credit stuff. Is Maybe there's another small credit that they roll out because you weren't able to have anything forgiven, but you should have been able to get something forgiven. It's just your banker held you up. Right. Yeah, I think it, the key is going to be don't disqualify yourself. If, if you right. don't see yourself like perfectly fitting into who qualifies and all the expenses that go into the calculation, still go and talk to a banker and have them disqualify you or on their first person to call when we do get that clarification. Uh, okay, switching gears to tax law changes. Um, obviously, a big one for a lot of people are the due date changes. Almost everything that was due any time period between April 15th and July 15th is now due July 15th. This does include Texas franchise returns, but does not include payroll tax returns. So that's kind of the big one that we that we see that hasn't um, that hasn't been pushed yet. But the last bullet point up there, legislation and guidance is constantly changing and coming out. I kind of feel like it's like um, the government or the the state turns the page and says, "Okay, tomorrow's a deadline. Oh, we should move that one too." So right. it's kind of coming up as the deadlines hit us, but. Most everything has been moved to July 15th, and that would include payments in between those time periods as well. Right. So, the, and the only caveat is to the TWC is they moved that to May 15th. They just started finally taking the reports. And, and what we discovered also, if you're looking at business property tax renditions, certain county, since we're everybody's, you know, different counties, certain counties extended, certain counties didn't. So, depending on where offices are located, you had to do your homework because they were technically due on 415. Some counties pushed it to May 15th and gave automatic extensions. Other counties said, nope, we still want it. So, yep. So, using retirement funds, you know, this could be a really great deal. Um, that if you're not 59 and a half, normally when you take money out of your retirement account, there's a 10% penalty. And what they came in with the legislation is they said, okay, well, so now let's just talk about this. Let's say you couldn't get any of this money. I told you, like, who knows what's going to happen if you don't get if you don't get any forgiveness money? How can you then access some capital reserves? And one of the ways is they said you can take a hundred thousand dollars out of your retirement fund with no ten percent tax penalty. Not only can you take it out, you then can take it out, and normally you have sixty days by which to then return that money to your account. Well, now we're going to give you three years, and so you have a three-year window by which to pay this money back into your retirement. So it's like getting an interest-free loan, or at least as far as we can tell, it's like an interest-free loan. And this counts, you can do this if you have an IRA or if you have a 401k plan. The only issue with 401k plans, if you're an employee somewhere, is a lot of employers said, hey, we're not going to allow loans out of our retirement programs. So they have to go amend their plans to allow this to happen. So it's it's a great three-year grace period. They What they haven't really discussed with us is, so now your goal, you take the money out, your goal is you're going to pay it all back, fast forward, oh man, there's no way this is happening. And so do we have to go back and amend all the tax returns or do we just get to just pay it in the year that you decided not to pay it all back? Um, and if you go down to the very bottom of that slide, it says required minimum distributions. And what that talks about is that if you are that you are supposed to take your required minimum distribution, that you're old enough to get retirement, 72, that they changed it with the SECURE Act, or it was, before that, it was 70 and a half. But regardless, if you, you don't have to take it this year. If you did take it and it, you don't need it, and you're still within a 60-day window, you can go back and redeposit it, and there are, you don't have to pick up the taxable income this year. So, which could be kind of nice if, if you didn't need it, because there's a lot of people who took the RMDs that really didn't need it quite yet. Okay. Yeah. These next few slides give a little more detail to um, the retirement plan items that John right. just mentioned about. So we'll and just so, skip over but, them. So the DB plan, one of the questions has come up that says, hey, can I fund, if I have a defined benefit, which is a plan that you could just put a lot of money in, right? Could I just go ahead and fund that today and just add that to my PPP loan? I think what's in the spirit of the law, what they're going to tell you is no. That really what you should be doing is only funding it with the the two twelfths of the DB plan, according to your compensation, not the entire year's benefit. Charitable contributions. 
if you look at charitable contributions, this is just, if you don't itemize, they give you $300 above the line that you can take. Um, and this is in place for 2020 and beyond. So you just, you know, who knows if they'll in, index this for inflation, but it's just, this to me is almost like the teacher $250 that they give you. Then while it sounds great and it's a great soundbite, it's not that much money in the end. It's a, maybe it's 50 extra dollars. So it's dinner. And then if you look at down below, most of my clients, I even have a client that, you know, I mean, don't feel bad for him, but he pays about half a million in property taxes. So you can understand his wealth. And he sends me little sound bites. And one of the things he sent me was all about this 60%. And I was thinking, you're never giving away half of your earnings, never mind 60% of your earnings. So while it sounds good on paper, this doesn't impact as many people as one might think. So yeah. One thing that CARES Act did oh, add- Oh, hold on, go back. They did, sure. raise, they did change the corporate donors, right? It used to be 10% of your adjusted taxable income. They raised that to 25, but that's assuming in 2020 that you're going to have taxable income. So, right, that's good. That's going to be a big F. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Um, so one thing they did add, previously an employer could pay up to $5,250 for an employee's higher educational expenses. The CARES Act added that same ability to pay, but for employee student loan insurance or student loans. Um, so if, if an employer is in a position where they want to give something back to their employees, not through payroll, not subject to payroll taxes, you can do that. If you give to both the student loan debt and the tuition, it's going to be both capped at 5250 So they get, both get the same um, treatment or the cap of 5250 You can't double the amount. And to the extent that the employer pays for a student loan interest, you're not going to be able to deduct the interest on your individual return. But that is an option for some employers. If you have some extra cash, don't want to put it in payroll, you can pay for student loans for your employees. Uh, this next one, Qualified Improvement Property Fix, this was a fix from the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that basically the intent of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was to say that if you had a qualified improvement to a property that you owned, instead of it having the traditional 39-year life and having to be recognized over the next 39 years, it should have a 15-year life and be subject to 100% bonus depreciation. It was not ultimately written like that in the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, so the CARES Act here made that correction. What's important about this is that this is retroactive back to January 1 of 2018. So they made it as if the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was written correctly. So if you have qualified improvement property that was placed in service from Jan 1 through now and gave it the 39-year life, you can go back and amend that return um, and they're coming out with more streamlining processes on how to do that, but you can go back and amend that return and recognize all of that in, in current year. So that, that was a good fix for, for people who have property, property. Right. And then with that, you can also just make sure you pay attention to the streamline and get with your accountant because you can do that 3115 where you don't necessarily have to amend everything. So they're, they're trying to make things easy for us to go grab cash. Um, on the net operating loss is another one that you write. What if you need cash and you have losses? And you, if you remember the care before the cares act with the tax cuts and job act, you had NOL, you couldn't do carrybacks. They weren't, they didn't exist. So you couldn't go back and get your cash. And now you can, so you can get this immediate cash infusion. And so, and you can do that from 18, 19 and 20, you can go back five years. And so what they've now done also though, is they've, they've, again, started to figure out the streamlined process of how to do this. And so the IRS has come out with guidance where you can fax it in. So you don't even have to then mail it because they're not really processing paper. So, and then the losses carried to 2019 and 2020 will be permitted to offset 100% of taxable income versus 80%. So there's some, some, they're trying to free up cash for you. And that's if your business had that net operating loss or if your personal return had that net operating loss. On the... The other part of the Tax Cuts and Job Act that they did, which caught a lot of people by surprise, is they had this excess business loss, which means if you had flow through from an S corporate partnership or your Schedule C, that you, if you were single, you were capped at $250,000. And so the example I used to give a lot was, so where else can you have $2 million of passive income for, or $2 million from investments and a loss of $2 million in a Schedule C and still end up having to pay tax on 1.5 million because you're only allowed half a million dollars of that loss from your schedule C if you were married. What they finally said is that other 1.5 was then just going to carry forward 
right? It's just like an NOL indefinitely. Now they've said you can take that $1.5 million loss. And so it's halted for 2020 and it's retroactive back to Jan 1 of 18. So again, you could go back and amend your 18 return if you were limited in 18 and get that money back. So if you already filed your 19 return, then you need to go back and think about amending that return because it will free it up. And that again, it doesn't exist for 2021. So it kicks back in for 2021. So it's a one year window to possibly free up cash. I've had several clients that were doing this for because they were, they're entrepreneur. If you're an entrepreneur based and you're using money, you had this loss that could have been limited. Yeah. So, so. another um, change, a lot of these seem to have been put in place with the tax cuts and jobs act and then removed with the cares act. But the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act brought about an interest limitation rule, which said that you couldn't deduct interest expense more than 30% of your adjusted taxable income. If you were a business with average annual gross receipts of more than 25 million or a tax shelter. And a lot of people saw the 25 million and thought, well, that's definitely not me. And then saw tax shelter and thought, well, I don't have a company in the Cayman Islands. That's definitely not me. But in fact, the definition of tax shelter is any partnership or other entity that's not a corporation that sends more than 35% of losses to passive limited partners, um, to limited partners, not passive, to limited partners. So there's a that applies to a lot of partnerships with losses that have more than 35% of their partnership are made up of limited partners. So a lot of companies um, were subject to this. What the CARES Act does is it increases that 30% up to 50% for 2019 and 2020. And it's going to allow us in 2020, assuming that unfortunately taxable income is going to be less in 2020, we're going to be able to use the 2019 taxable income in this calculation uh, for the 2020 return. If you're a partnership, because this passed after most partnership returns were due March 15th, you're not going to get the 50% limitation, but in 2020, whatever you had suspended, 50% of it is going to be recognized um, in that year. So um, this is a big thing to look for, um, and mostly it's just forward-looking in 2019 and 2020. Our last slide here is don't forget the IRS is home too. Um, the IRS is not taking live phone calls. They're not processing paper returns, which can be an issue for all the times today that we've said amended returns. Um, many of those have to be paper filed, except for where they're giving us guidance to be able to fax them. Um, and the concerning thing is the backlog of all the processing that's not happening right now. Um, so not only what we're experiencing is computer generated notices, if you've got penalties or fines, all those notices are still going out. And we as professionals have no way to call the IRS and contact them. They're telling us they're not processing paper, so we can't write them a letter like we normally would in response. Um, and it could put our, our taxpayers in a really tricky position that if the computer is continuing to generate notices and possibly go to the levy level, um, we just don't know right now. Um, so for as much as we can tell, the IRS is, is still at home too. Well, and what they've said is they're gonna protect their interest in some audits, um, but, but they're not supposed to be taking enforcement actions. But I can tell you two days ago, I got sent to me a notice of a client that said intent to levy. And the IRS was supposed to be fixing something on their account. Well, clearly the IRS went home or the agents who were supposed to be taking care of this specific function went home. So no one is fixing their account. What we don't, and it's, what we don't know is, will the computer then automatically gener generate the notice to the bank that says, hey, levy this account? They've said no, but then my client still got the levy notice. And so we're, there's a bit of a disconnect from their computer systems to then what the IRS is putting out. Um, and by the way, my client does owe money. They just owe 50 cents on the dollar of what the IRS is saying they owe, but we can't get their account updated. Yeah. And, and so it's one of these tricky situations of um, how to deal with the revenue service when they're closed and you can't reach an agent because so many of, so much of the IRS is 1-800-CALL-NOWHERE for most of us that we don't get, we don't get relationships. You know, if you get into the high dollar audits or you, you're having something happen, you have a connection, but the way the IRS works, it's not like I can call a connection with one audit to help me with another case. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't work. 
Yeah. Because they don't all get access. They have to be granted access for their different case lines. So, the, yeah. you know, I, I was talking to a client that um, I was saying, you know, the only way to describe some of even for us as practitioners when we're dealing with IRS issues today until we figure out when they come back to work is when I started and I was telling you about my daughter as a parent, we were totally helpless, right? She was in a negative pressurized room and you couldn't go in there. You couldn't touch her and you were just helpless. And there's certain components of what we're doing today where we have never in our professional careers felt helpless that all of a sudden there's components of what we did on a normal daily schedule that we're just helpless because we just don't have the tools that we're used to having. Um, um, this last slide that's up is, one is, if you have a question that you didn't ask or you hang up from this and you're like, hey, wait, I meant to ask this, there's an email address that we monitor, caresact at willypen.com. And then if you go to our website, in the upper right-hand corner is a sign up, and we send out a lot of tax alerts. That are, we try, we're really, if something comes out today, you'll see it up there tonight or tomorrow morning. And so whether it's guidance, like, so what just came out today was an FAQ for large businesses, 500 and above, and we'll probably have something out on our website today or tomorrow, right? They haven't even finished it. So we get all these out really quickly to be helpful. And we've been, we've been told that they're helpful. So, and we have a, if you go to our website, we also have a thing that says COVID and you click on it, you can see all the prior updates and FAQs and links. Um, clearly, if there's something, if something doesn't work, please let us know. Um, Kristen and I also monitor that CARES Act at WhitleyPen.com. If you are a Whitley Pen client, we would also encourage you to reach out to your, w, your Whitley Pen professional as well. Don, Kristen, thank you so much. Um, I, I do have a question. So you've really gone through a lot and have insight, obviously, more than, than most of us on, on the CARES Act. So let's say that uh, our governmental representatives, our senators, our, our House of Representatives, uh, come to you and say, okay, you know, you, you've been in this, you've seen this. What are some things that uh, you're seeing from your clients that this is not, um, where are there opportunities to help more of your clients that you've come about, that, that have come up through your conversations that should be added to, to future funding? What, what would you say to that? You know, I, I think like when I look at the funding side, if why they came out with a uniform form, what they didn't come out with was uniform guidance on information collection. So for instance, a lot of folks just sent in a W3 and the banks funded off their W3 from 2019. That's all they needed. I had another client that we had to send in, I kid you not, four or five spreadsheets and the 940s and the W3s and projections and how we expected it to be forgiven really all beyond the scope of the law and the legislation. And all that really does is prohibit that person from possibly getting funding. I also think that they should have, they should have figured out a way, like I'll give you the classic example. So right now I've got a client, I feel really horrible about this because again, I feel helpless. It's, it's a partnership. It's two folks in the partnership. They get guaranteed payments. There's a self-employment component to the law. And what they've said is if the partnership is, has to file for the PPP loan, what his bank's telling him is you don't have any W-2s or 940s, so you don't qualify. Well, it's right there in the update, in the guidance of this is what they have to do now. And so there's a disconnect between what the banks are being told and what the SBA guidance is. And so when you, so it's really trying to make sure that the banks are on board and they're really mm -hmm. feeding the banks quickly because if you're in line for this money and then you get told no by the time you figure out how to cure your application or find another bank who will take the application then you're stuck right you're not going to get the money like i mean i literally had my client today say well what if i just send him he keeps telling me to send him a schedule c and i said well we can't do that for you because you don't have a schedule c and so you know it creates this whole idea of so do you want the taxpayer or the business person to kind of fraudulently submit a form because it's the only way for them to get their loan when they're trying to do it the right way? So I think if they just could come up with some clear guidance for the banks and be uniform, it'd be a little easier. Yeah, yeah I think the only thing I would add is just, I hope that the 
every taxpayer that was intended to benefit from this doesn't get caught off with some little minute detail of you had to unfortunately let, let someone go two days before you could have actually let them go with no implications mm -hmm. and that screwed up the whole thing for you. You know, I hope they keep the taxpayers in mind as this plays out, having started it with such little guidance. Right. Well, um, certainly a lot of moving fast and I know you and your professionals in, in the accounting world are doing great work to be able to help and make this happen. And uh, I hope you both are taking notes. So you can write a, a book about it. <laughs> so, uh, thanks so much again to John and, and uh, Kristen. You see their contact information on the screen. Uh, that's it for, for today. Um, we'll have a new lineup of uh, leaders online next week. Uh, tomorrow at 10 o'clock on our LinkedIn um, uh, site or our LinkedIn page, we're going to have um, a session at 10 a.m. about um, marketing your business uh, on LinkedIn. So tune in uh, to the Fort Worth Chambers LinkedIn uh, account tomorrow at 10 if you're wanting to learn more about how you can market using LinkedIn. So again, thank you so much to John and Kristen. Thanks to you all. We appreciate you so much. Um, these are long and challenging days, but I know we're going to get through this together. So thanks a lot, and we'll see you again real soon. Thank you. Thank you.